Coming up on We Talk Nerdy, I've got the tech news of the week, Raspberry Pi, and Red Jam. What the heck am I talking about? Stay tuned and I'll tell you all about it. That's coming up next on We Talk Nerdy. We Talk Nerdy. We Talk Nerdy.tv is sponsored by UBU Enterprises, specializing in custom business website design, social media marketing, and online branding strategies for companies and products. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode four of We Talk Nerdy. I'm your host, Dave Larson, and this is the show where we talk about tech news, reviews, and how to's. I apologize to those of you who were expecting a show last week. But I was ill and in no shape to do any kind of a show. But I'm back this week, and hopefully it'll be smooth sailing from here on out. Uh, I'd like to start off this week with the case of Andrew Arnheimer, a.k.a. Weave. Uh, he's the at and hacker who was recently sentenced to a three-and-a-half-year prison sentence for exploiting a hole in at and network security. He stole uh, roughly 120,000 iPad uh, users' email addresses. Um, I don't really know where to start with this one. Um, this is absolutely outrageous. Um, he's being prosecuted under the Federal Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, uh, which was enacted in the 90s sometime. And it's horribly out of date and overbroad. And uh, according to LiveScience.com, Arnheimer didn't write the script or compile the data, nor did he publish the email addresses. Instead, he just reported the security flaw to the media. This decision, if it stands, affects everyone who ever discovered a security flaw, wrote security researcher Alex Pilosov. Sorry if I mispronounced that. If security research is forced underground because of the chilling effect of possible prosecution, we will all suffer. Running a script is not a crime, tweeted digital rights lawyer and Stanford professor Jennifer Granick. Following the verdict, exceeding authorized access is, but the AT&T site was coded to spill data. I don't know how this is a crime that's worthy of three and a half years in prison. Um, AT&T should be thanking this guy for finding a security flaw and they should hire him to help them fix it. An email address is not a secure piece of data. Many email addresses are publicly available and easily discoverable. That's kind of the whole idea. You want people to be able to reach you via email, at least most of the time. Uh, the whole credit, he, if he had stolen credit card numbers or uh, you know sold sensitive financial information, that would have been one thing. But he didn't do any of that. Um, for the record, this is what security researchers do for a living. They find security flaws, they notify the parties involved, and hopefully those flaws get fixed. This improves security for all of us. This kind of hacking is known as white hat hacking because it's actually helpful. Sensible companies, unlike AT&T, actually pay bounties for bugs and flaws like this, encouraging hackers to improve software and overall security. Google, for example, uh, offered more than $3 million in reward money at this year's Pwn to Own conference for successfully breaching Chrome OS. Surprisingly, no one, able, no one was able to compromise Chrome OS, um, which is very unusual, but that just shows how these kinds of things can actually improve security for all of us. Prosecuting crimes like these uh, with such harsh penalties discourages white hat hackers from coming forward and it does have a chilling effect on security. Now, I grant you, he may not have gone about revealing the security flaw in the best way possible. He did report the security hole to a website called Gawker, uh, a practice often followed by security researchers that calls attention to security holes. And he reportedly bragged about the deed online. Now, this guy is kind of a troll, but that behavior doesn't deserve anything more than a slap on the wrist. And I hope that the prosecutors in this case will come to their senses and perhaps give him a reduced sentence. Moving on. Just a few days after Google announced that it would kill Reader, uh, Google launched a new service called Keep. Uh, if you've got a Google account, you can access Keep from drive.google.com keep. 
If you have an Android device running uh, version 4.0 or better, you can download the Keep app from the Play Store, um, and, but you don't need the app to use Keep. Uh, you can just use your browser. Keep lets you take uh, notes and uh, easily make uh, lists and uh, store information on your Google Drive. Uh, it even has some voice transcription availability. I don't think this is an Evernote killer, but it's certainly a very powerful application. Some folks in the tech community have expressed concerns about using Keep. If Google is going to kill Google Reader uh, and Wave <clears throat> and some of the other apps that they've killed, oh, what you know, why would Keep necessarily stay around? If it doesn't catch a following, Google may kill it too. And I think that's probably a valid question. Uh, but I think the simple answer is that uh, if Google does decide to sunset Keep uh, at some point down the road, uh, I think you can be sure that they will give you lots of notice uh, and you'll be able to migrate your data to some other place like Evernote, for example. Um, this wouldn't necessarily discourage me from using Keep, but it does make me question uh, how long it might be around. Also, there was a lot of noise this week about the largest cyber attack in history. Apparently, uh, anti-spam agency Spam House suffered a massive DDoS attack after they blacklisted a so-called internet safe haven called CyberBunker. Uh, for their part, CyberBunker denies that they had anything to do with this attack. And uh, just so you know, a DDS, uh, DDoS stands for Distributed Denial of Service. Uh, in simple terms, this is when thousands of computers uh, flood servers with requests for data. It slows them down to a crawl and sometimes disables them altogether. In this case, the attackers uh, targeted DNS servers. They're kind of like the yellow pages of the internet, so to speak which, apart from respecting Spam House, reportedly caused slowdowns elsewhere. Netflix was widely reported to be having problems. The only problem with that is no one asked Netflix. Yes, it was the largest cyber attack ever, but outside Spam House and CyberBunker, there wasn't a whole lot of fallout. Later in the week, um, CyberBunker was actually knocked offline when someone attacked them in retaliation. There are a number of sensational headlines out there about how this was crippling the internet and it's you know going to uh, cause problems for all of us. And fact is a little difficult to separate from fiction here. Um, this is kind of a case of nerd rage run amok. Um, I think you can safely say that the death of the internet has been greatly exaggerated. Um, Hopefully these parties will be able to resolve their differences and we can go back to normal things. Speaking of exaggerated deaths, uh, BlackBerry surprised investors last week by not losing more money. <laughs> According to Forbes, analysts had actually expected BlackBerry to report a loss equating to roughly 30 cents a share for the, last quarter, for the fourth quarter of last year. According to estimates compiled by Bloomberg, uh, it actually posted a profit of 22 cents a share. Um, BlackBerry reports that they have sold uh, 1 million Z10 phones. That's their new touchscreen device. Uh, and this is good news for BlackBerry. Um, keep in mind that Apple sold 27.4 million iPhone 5 units in the third quarter of 2012. So they're substantially behind the curve. Um, BlackBerry isn't out of the woods yet by any means, but you know, if the company is stable, um, perhaps now they can focus on making up some lost ground. Uh, the Z10 is getting generally good reviews, and if you love BlackBerry and you're invested in the BlackBerry ecosystem, this might be a good phone for you. Um, if you want a new BlackBerry with a real physical keyboard, um, you're going to have to wait for the BlackBerry Q10. Uh, which is expected to ship sometime uh, in the month of April. Um, the Z10 is available on all four major U.S. carriers, including T-Mobile, which just announced a brand new pricing structure for its services. T-Mobile is America's fourth largest wireless carrier, and it announced earlier this week that they were completely done with cell phone contracts. Uh, at a press conference, T-Mobile announced that uh, they were creating a new simple choice plan under uh, which you set up a payment plan for a phone and then you pay uh, a monthly service 
on top of that. You pay a monthly service plan and there's not gonna be any uh, contract. Uh, for example, you can get an iPhone 5 or the BlackBerry Z10 for $99 down plus $20 a month for two years. On top of the service plan, you have to pay for. Presumably, if you go to another carrier within those two years, uh, you still have to pay off the phone. But once you own the phone, you just have to pay your monthly service charge. So your bill will go down once you've finished paying off the phone. Um, so if you're not the kind of person who wants a new phone every two years, this could be a really good option for you. Um, T-Mobile sounds like a pretty good deal to me. I don't have T-Mobile um, and I pay a fairly hefty fee to my carrier each month. I'd like to have lower payments once I've paid off the phone and I'm kind of hoping that maybe other carriers, mine included, will see the success of this and perhaps follow suit. Um, also, T-Mobile is rolling out a high-speed LTE network. Now, it's only coming to a select number of cities, but it does make the deal more attractive. Um, perhaps this will give a T-Mobile a leg up and um, maybe make it a little bit more competitive with uh, some of the larger carriers like uh, AT&T and Verizon. Finally, I'd like to add a little bit of news of my own. Uh, it's taken some time, but We Talk Nerdy is now available at the iTunes store. Uh, if you have an iPad or an iPhone or you just use iTunes on your PC or Mac, you can now subscribe to We Talk Nerdy via iTunes and get either the video version or the audio only version and it's delivered to you each week automatically on your device. If you use Android or some other podcatching software, there are compatible links for you on my website. Just surf over to wetalknerdy.tv and click on how to connect. Uh, and as always, if you have any problems or questions, feel free to send me an email at wetalknerdy.tv at gmail.com. This week, I'm reviewing the HMDX Jam. The Jam is a Bluetooth-enabled portable speaker and it comes in this cute little container that actually looks like a jam jar. It's powered by a lithium ion battery and it communicates over Bluetooth with Bluetooth enabled audio devices. In addition to Bluetooth, it also has a standard auxiliary input and the manufacturer claims you can use it for about four hours over Bluetooth or about 12 hours if you're using the aux in. These days, most phones and tablets support wireless Bluetooth audio and setting it up is really easy. If you're not sure how to set it up, it actually comes with a nice little instruction booklet and a very short USB cable for charging. It comes in six different colors and it retails for 50 bucks, but you can get it for as little as $35 on Amazon. Uh, check our show notes and I'll provide a link right to it for you. Now, I picked up one of these at an electronics store at Heathrow Airport when I was uh, there last fall. And because I was looking for a inexpensive portable sound solution and I was rather charmed by it. <clears throat> so I probably paid a little bit too much, but I went ahead and I took a chance on it. And I'm happy to say uh, that it has pretty decent sound for such a small speaker. Granted, this isn't going to be able to compete with a nice stereo system, but this little jam is very portable and I really like the container it comes in. Um, it keeps it well protected. It's fairly sturdy. It is made of plastic, um, but it'll keep it protected in your bag or your backpack. The only real drawback that I can find uh, for this is that the USB charging cable is only 10 inches long. Um, but if you're like me, you probably have other cables that will work with it. Overall, I would give the HMDX Jam five stars. It's inexpensive, it has decent battery life, and pretty good sound for such a small package. It's not something I would use every day, but it's perfect for traveling or if you're hanging out by the pool or picnic or something like that and you just want to listen to some audio on the go, it's really ideal for that. Now, I'd like to talk to you briefly about our sponsor, UBU Enterprises. Do you need a website for your small business or maybe you need help managing your business's social media? UBU Enterprises can help you. They have helped me a lot with my website. They took my ideas, they added their own flair for design, and they really helped me get my website exactly where I wanted it to be. 
I couldn't have done it without them. And the best part is they're still helping me make sure my site runs smoothly. Visit them at ubuenterprises.com. In this week's how-to segment, I want to give you an introduction to the Raspberry Pi. As you probably figured out by now, the Raspberry Pi is not a dessert. It's a credit card, credit card sized single board computer developed in the United Kingdom uh, by the Raspberry Pi Foundation with the intention of promoting the teaching of basic computer science in schools. It's available for as little as $35, and at that price, this is a terrific bargain. The version I have here is a Pi Model B. It has two USB ports, composite and HDMI video out, stereo out, 512 megs of RAM, and a 10100 Ethernet port. Both uh, the A and B models are based on a 700 megahertz uh, ARM processor, and there are a number of operating systems that you can run on it, uh, the most common being Linux. Uh, according to Wikipedia, there are also versions of the Chrome OS and Android uh, that are either available now or will be coming soon. Uh, there are a few other neat options coming uh, soon, like the GERT board, uh, which is designed by the Raspberry Pi Foundation people. And it's designed also for educational purposes, and it expands the Raspberry Pi's uh, GPIO pins, which are these pins right here, uh, and that allows the Pi to interface with and control um, LEDs, switches, analog signals, um, sensors, and other devices. It also includes an optional Arduino compatible controller, uh, which is great news for people who uh, like messing around with this kind of electronic kit. Um, there's also a camera in the works, and recently the folks at Raspberry Pi Foundation have uh, opened an app store uh, that offers games, apps, development tools, and tutorials uh, that are for download. Um, many of them are free, and uh, I think this is a really great uh, little computer, uh, especially um, for you know, teaching your kids about computers. It's very basic, um, but it's really ideal and they can be completely hands-on with it. Um, this little computer has about as much phone, uh, sorry, has about as much power as say a slightly older cell phone. Um, it's pretty amazing for such an inexpensive computer. Um, and again, if you have kids that are interested in computers, I think this is a great thing to have. It's powerful enough that they can learn about computers, uh, programming, and even robotics with the Arduino. Um, it's inexpensive enough to replace it if they break it. And uh, like I said, I think this is an awesome, awesome thing to have around. Now, big question is, what can you do with it, right? Well, as I mentioned, it's a decent platform for learning about computers and programming. Um, most of the installations, as far as I know, um, uh, come with uh, the Python programming language. So if you're into it, you can teach your kids about Python programming. Um, there's lots of people out there using the Raspberry Pi as a digital media center. Um, you can download and install Xbox Media Center on this. Um, you can also use it as a controller for a network attached storage device. Heck, I've even got pictures here of a guy who um, made a bicycle light with a speed indicator using a Raspberry Pi. As for me, uh, I'm going to use my Raspberry Pi as an inexpensive, always on BitTorrent server. Um, this is perfect for me. Um, I can uh, use it to serve uh, we talk nerdy TV episodes over BitTorrent. I can have it always on. Um, and uh, I'm in the process of getting that set up right now. Um, I've been doing some testing and according to my trusty little kilowatt, it says that I'm using a peak power of nine watts and averaging about six watts or so um, when it's connected to the internet. Um, once I have it set up and working reliably, I'll be able to provide an always-on BitTorrent feed for anyone who wants to download We Talk Nerdy uh, over BitTorrent, and it won't cost me very much in electricity. Uh, nine volts, is, or sorry, nine watts is very reasonable uh, power drain. So when you buy a Raspberry Pi, this is what you get. That's it. So you might want to think about what else you're going to need in order to make it work. 
At the minimum, you're going to need an SD card because that's what the operating system runs off of. I think the smallest one that will still work is a two gigabyte. Um, I'm using a four gigabyte and I think that is generally the recommended size. Um, bigger is better. If you can get a eight gig uh, SD card, that would be even better. Um, and generally speaking, you should try to get one uh, that's a class 10 uh, SD card. Those are the faster ones. Um, you're also going to need a video cable, either HDMI or composite video. Uh, I have one that is HDMI on one end and DVI on the other so that I can hook it up to my monitor because my monitor doesn't have an HDMI cable input. You'll probably also want to get a little USB power adapter uh, with a micro USB cable to provide the power. Um, if you have a lot of electronics, you will probably have some of these lying around. Uh, and you may also want to get a powered USB hub. The Model B comes with um, two USB ports. The Model A only has one. Um, and neither one of them provides a whole lot of power. A powered USB hub lets you connect a bunch of USD, USB devices uh, without having to draw too much power off the Pi itself. Um, I have a 10 port model that I'm using, um, but you probably don't need quite that much. It's a little overkill. Of course, you're also going to need a USB keyboard and a mouse. And finally, you might want to consider getting a case of some kind. Now, there are some cardboard designs out there that you can download and print out um, on your printer and make yourself. There's also some plastic ones that you can purchase uh, for just a few dollars. Um, I bought some chocolates while I was in Belgium last fall, and I've been saving the tin for just such an occasion. It's the perfect size for a raspberry, cake, a raspberry pie case, and here's how I did it. First of all, since it's a metal case, I needed to figure out how to keep the pie from touching the case, lest I short circuit something. Now, I could put some kind of insulating material between the circuit board and the tin, but I thought using standoffs would be a nicer looking and provide for better cooling. A standoff is just a little metal cylinder that can be screwed together with the circuit board to provide space between the case and the board. You can buy these fairly cheaply at Radio Shack or some other electronic supplier. Once I laid out where I wanted the pie within the case, I used a Sharpie to mark some cut lines. Then it was a simple matter of drilling some holes for the cables and cutting some openings with a Dremel tool and a cutting disc. Once you cut the holes, be sure to use a grinding wheel of some kind to get rid of any metal shavings or sharp edges. The whole process took about an hour or so. And there you have it. It's a very nice little home for my Raspberry Pi. Well, that's it for this week. I hope you've enjoyed the show. Next week, I'm going to walk you through the basic steps of downloading an operating system for the Pi and getting it set up so you can do whatever kind of project might interest you. Remember, if you have problems or questions that need answers, send us an email at wetalknerdy.tv at gmail.com. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next Monday. Says my sir.